I would like you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew. I want you to listen with a pen in hand, write some things down that you can repeat to your friends and especially to your family. In Matthew chapter 18, we'll begin with verse 1 and then share just some of the passages God has put upon my heart. I'm speaking on our church and our children. Our church and our children. If I'd given such a topic decades ago, most everyone in the audience would say, churches and children's ministries are for this purpose. And almost everyone would get it right. This is why we're here. And generation after generation can be influenced for God and for his glory. But now, it's a little of everything. So let's give some Biblical clarity to all of this, if we possibly can. Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child, in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Here we have this discussion of Jesus and children and the emphasis he places on children. Chapter 19, if you'll look at it please. Verse 13. Then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. What we have here are biblical incidents of Jesus dealing with children. And when we talk about our church and our children, remember that Christ is still here in the body of believers that make up a local assembly. And it is, I think, altogether truthful and right to say what we see Christ doing with children is what churches should be doing with children. This is his body on the earth. And so if we need a definition for what we're to do, Let's do what Christ did and would do. And so the things that we understand about the work of the Lord Jesus with children are the things that we should be doing with children. We should be placing the emphasis where God places the emphasis. I want you to write this down. This means we should give much attention to creation and what God's word says about creation. If you'd like to write this verse down in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. People have no idea why they're on earth. The idea to find purpose on earth is to discover what God has done in creation. When you open your Bible and begin in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning God created. Why does God place such an emphasis on creation? And here, in the days of thy youth, to remember thy creator. And so in all of our dealing with children in our church, we must place a strong emphasis on the subject of creation and talk about God's eternal purpose in creation. The second thing I want you to note, if you'll turn with me, please, is that children know there is a God. 
They know there's a God. If you turn to the book of Romans chapter 1, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Every human being ever born knows there is a God. And there are two witnesses of the reality of God. One is in creation and the other is in conscience. God says here in verse 19 of chapter 1 of Romans, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. I enjoy telling the story of Helen Keller who was both blind and deaf at a certain juncture in her life, a famous preacher was brought to her by the name of Brooks. And when he had his conversation with Helen Keller through her interpreter, Miss Annie Sullivan, Helen's response to the preacher was, I have always known, always, that there was a God. I just didn't know his name. And I want you to know when you hold a baby in your arms, when you start working with a child, when you're dealing with little ones, when we're following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, remember that every child knows there's a God. And the Bible is God's revelation of himself, so we work hard. For the third thing, if you look at it, please, the Word of God says in the book of 2 Timothy, Beginning with verse 14 of chapter 3. We continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I love this word known in verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. As Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to his son in the ministry, Timothy, he says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Think of this. The Bible is God's unfolding story of redemption. The Bible is God's revelation, his unveiling, his revealing of himself. So children must be taught the Bible and therefore being taught about God. There's enough of the knowledge of God in every human being because we all know there's a God to condemn us, but there's not enough of the knowledge of God to save us. And we must know who he is. And God has revealed himself, and he reveals himself perfectly in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there's another thing I want you to write down. If you turn back to the book of Colossians, parents are God's instructors concerning God and his word. In Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says in this long list of things about the peace of God, beginning with verse 15, Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly in verse 16. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus in verse 17. And then there are people and words for people. Wives, submit. Verse 19, husbands, love. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. It's God's desire that parents instruct their children and that children are obedient to parents so parents can be their teachers. I'm going to show you something. No church that's following the Lord should try to take the place of parents. Never. Never. We have a unique thing that goes on here because some people like to subcontract everything they do for their children spiritually to someone else. I am totally opposed to that. There are people who get the idea we bring our children up to the door of a Christian school and unload them and now they're your responsibility to teach them spiritual truth. That is not God's way. There are people who think we bring them to Sunday school on Sunday and it's the teacher's responsibility to teach them about God. The teachers can enhance that and work with that, but that's not God's way. There are even organizations deliberately designed for children and people plug their kids into those organizations and get the idea that's where our children get spiritual training. And we did a survey. I can give the results of it. We asked the parents of children who were in that particular organization, how many of you 
read the Bible and pray with your children, 76% of them said we do not ever do that. We bring them and they name the meeting. We bring them to the meeting and we expect those people to do the Bible reading and praying with our children. That's three out of four parents. In a church where this ministry was started, this particular children's ministry, God has not changed his mind. God has ordained that parents teach their children about the true and living God. And we live in such a busy world. I think I understand that. And we, we abdicate responsibilities and <laughs> deputize people to do things. We subcontract people for things with our children and sometimes a bit of it is necessary. But would you listen and look just a moment? When we meet Jesus as parents, we're going to be reminded that God and parents came before children. In the way God designed creation, God existed before children existed. Parents existed before children existed. And just like God gave the creation of water in existence before he created fish and created the atmosphere where birds could fly before he created birds, God and parents precede children because it's God's design that parents instruct their children about God. Now many times somebody has to step in. But churches should not be held accountable for being the lone, only teacher about God. Churches should be saying amen to what God-fearing parents are doing already with their sons and daughters. That's my conviction. Our church, our children, we work hard at it. But our greatest work is helping and encouraging parents to do what God's given them to do. Agreed? Let's pray.